Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so good to see everybody here in person tonight and certainly to, to welcome our folks here at home. Um, this is an exciting May evening for us. So this actually marks the return of the Schwartz Lecture for in-person since the first time since 2019. So let's just take a moment to kind of say we're back and I'm glad that you all could be here with us tonight. So thank you all for being here. I'm so grateful to have you all here as educators, advocates, partners in this critical work. In addition to those attending, we actually have about 700 participants online. So just imagine an army of folks behind you back there who don't have as good a seats as you, but uh, and don't can't be part of this energy. But we're so glad you're online with us and so glad you could be here and joining us tonight. From actually, we have about 16 countries represented from all over the world. So, and I just want to take a moment to thank you all for your service to, that you've done to advance literacy outcomes for all, and especially for students with language-based learning disabilities. The annual Robert J. Schwartz Memorial Lecture was established by Ms. Gail Ross in memory of her husband, Mr. Robert J. Schwartz, a compassionate and dedicated former Board of Trustee member who passed away in 1997. Each fall and spring, the Wimberd School and the Wimberd Institute invite an esteemed practitioner in the field of literacy to present on a lecture on a topic relevant to our school's mission in the interest of informing and inspiring and engaging our community in this work. The Wimberd Institute was formed in 2020 with several overarching goals. First, we wanted to actively engage with the most current research in the field of reading and translate that work into practice. In order to inform our work at Windward here in professional development offerings for both internal teacher training and for the courses that we offer to the community at large. Each year, the Windward Institute welcomes hundreds of educators from around the nation to its courses. And we also provide about 11,000 hours of professional development to our faculty annually, a found, which is a foundational piece of the success here at Windward in our academic program. Secondly, we wanted to form partnerships with leading educational institutions to expand impact, advance research in the field. And one such example is our partnership with the Haskins Global Literacy Hub for the in-school neuroscience study to see if our multi-sensory work actually impacts neurology over time, which is incredibly exciting. And finally, we're here to be advocates for our students with language-based learning disabilities and to raise awareness for the science of reading. These free lectures are open to the public twice a year, and those are part of this advocacy work. In addition to the Read podcast, the many workshops and seminars that we offer, um, and in collaboration with lawmakers on educational reform to address the literacy crisis that continues to plague students in our country. The Wimberton Institute celebrated its two-year anniversary uh, by reflecting on its growth, by looking forward towards the future and its efforts to disrupt the status quo and impact some literacy initiatives all around the world. But one key initiative that came out of these discussions was the, the, the idea of cultivating a very robust advisory board to help guide us in the path here at the Institute. The advisory committee actually provides strategic advice regarding current and planned research, offers guidance to our faculty and academic leadership, introduces staff to other leaders in the educational field, and you know, in the educational field and scientific communities, but also provides scientific or research resources and helps identify strategic priorities and what's next for us at the Winburn Institute. And I would also add that the Winburn Institute and its programs are made possible by the time, talents, and donations by many in the audience here tonight. And for that, we are so incredibly grateful. Thank you for your continued support. And tonight, we are actually very fortunate to welcome Dr. Yakov Petcher. Dr. Petcher is a professor in the School of Social Work and Associate Director at the Florida Center for Reading and Research at the Florida State University, as well as the Deputy Director of the National Center on Improving Literacy. To say he's a prolific researcher is a massive understatement. Dr. Petcher, no, not to embarrass you here, bud, but you have a 51-page CV, which is really impressive. If that gives you any indication of the scope of the contributions that he's had in the field of literacy. He has published more than 133 articles in peer-reviewed publications, including the Journal of Special Education, Journal of Educational Psychology, Journal of Learning Disabilities, Journal of Speech and Hearing and Language Research, and Reading and Writing, to name only a handful here. And he's been a principal investigator for 41 studies and counting. I actually first had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Petra in South Africa at an international research symposium. And his incredible command of the research, research design and statistics was deeply impressive, along with the insatiable curiosity with this man seems to possess in his work. Just incredibly incredible. 
So Dr. Petra's work with collaborators has been recognized with awards in, uh, from the Society of Scientific Study of Reading, the International Literacy Association, the American uh, Education Research Association, MIT Solve Challenge, and the Florida Educational Research Association, among others. Dr. Petra has also written uh, a couple of books on the subject of literacy, having published the book Fluency Construct and Applied Quantitative Analysis in Education for Social Sciences. I promise you it's a very engaging read. <laughs> So it's, it's, you know, this is, we've got a really great kind of qualitative, quantitative uh, research mind coming here tonight, and we're so happy to have him here. But he's also a frequent presenter at universities and conferences. Dr. Petra also sits on the advisory board for the U.S. Department of Education in the Institute of Educational Science, the Florida Department of Education, and the American Educational Research Association, in addition to the esteemed Windward Advisory Board uh, and Windward Institute Advisory Board. Um, but his current con research concerns the early identification of reading disabilities and the role of trauma in reading and language development. This evening, Dr. Petra will address the whole child approaches to the identification and support of children with dyslexia. Addressing and supporting the needs of children with dyslexia requires an integrated, comprehensive approach at the family, school, and community levels. And a small aside, if you haven't had the chance to read the latest issue of The Beacon, you can find this theme running throughout that entire issue, and I urge you to go do that. As we know at Windward, there's a disproportionate burden placed on schools around the identification and intervention of dyslexia. And while, as we look at the work here, whole child approaches to assessment, identification, and intervention are absolutely critical in this work. So Dr. Petra will discuss the reading development through a lens of the whole child approach and principles and the integration of learning across the social, emotional, and academic factors. So please join me in giving a warm welcome for Dr. Petra tonight's presentation, exploring the whole child approaches for identification. Thank you. Good evening. It is truly an honor to be here. Uh, and Jamie, uh, that was a wonderful introduction. You know, I've been called many things in my career. Uh, statistical alchemist, uh, Monte Carlo data junkie, but never have I been called a practitioner. Uh, so that's just, that's a wonderful addition to uh, the terminology. Um, so thanks for everyone for coming out tonight. I want to especially thank my gracious hosts here at Windward School, especially uh, Alexis and Sonia and Danielle, who as many or most of you may know had uh, an unfortunate task of corralling me to get info on the talk and headshots. And uh, they just did an excellent job of moving things along for today. So thank you so much for such a warm reception opportunity here. And one of the really great things about being at Windward today is that uh, throughout the tour and talking with everyone from uh, Jamie to teachers to admin folks, uh, is that if, if I was to take like a word cloud or make a word cloud of everything that was said in today's conversations, one, one of the biggest phrases that would come out of it um, would be, well, research says dot, 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 so we do. Uh, or research shows dot, 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 and so we do. So uh, I'm actually a little bit nervous uh, that if my scientific game is off here a little bit, I'm gonna get called out because everyone here is so knowledgeable about the science and, and instructing based on the science, uh, but that's a good thing. I hope people might call out some of the bad ideas or the fallible ideas that are here tonight. Uh, but what I wanna do is uh, maybe start by giving us a little bit of a roadmap to follow, partly because it's helpful to know where we're going, uh, and partly because with my uh, ADHD, I sometimes, rabbit, well, sometimes, I often will rabbit trail and detour a bit. And so to start our time together, uh, with there being rightly so a lot of discussion around the idea of whole child services, uh, whole child frameworks, and systems for education being discussed in academia and policy around whole child, part of what I think we want to consider are some of the broad strokes of what do we actually mean by whole child? And importantly, why should something like whole child, a whole child approach have relevance when we talk about the science of reading? Uh, next, I'll discuss a little bit about maybe two particular constructs, two particular domains that fit within a whole child perspective that could hold promise for us in the science of reading, and then talk about what we're learning about these constructs. Uh, how it may hold promise for us in screening and early identification of kids who are at risk for dyslexia. Uh, and then a few thoughts about where we might to want to go in light of that. 
And so uh, maybe one of the things you might be picking up on what I'm saying here is uh, there's a little bit there's a little bit of nuance to the language that I'm using right now. Uh, nothing that I've said so far is about something that has been settled. Uh, this isn't gravity. Uh, and <laughs> so the role of a whole child perspective and how it may interact with the science of reading, this is not settled science. Uh, this is this is really emerging. It's exploratory. Uh, and in many ways, there are fewer answers. Uh, but what I think there are are also great opportunities for consideration that we're going to think about together. So to start, as I said, I think it's helpful for us to maybe gain some definitional clarity about what we even mean by whole child, because in many ways, um, it, it's sometimes like you know it when you see it or you know it when you hear it. But nailing down a really good definition can be hard. So maybe it's helpful for us to consider a few different definitions. Uh, so first, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative defines a whole child approach to education this way. Uh, a whole child approach to education is one that honors the humanity of each teacher and student and is critical to equitably preparing each student to reach their full potential. This starts by creating environments of belonging and connection for students and adults to engage and thrive. So that's one helpful perspective. Uh, the United Nations, their education uh, and scientific organization committee, they recently created, it's an international declaration of education that sets forth this global vision for education in the next 15 years. And here's what they say with regards to a whole child approach. They say relevant learning outcomes must be well-defined in cognitive and non-cognitive domains and continually assessed as an integral part of the teaching and learning process. Quality education includes the development of those skills, values, attitudes, and knowledge that enable citizens to lead healthy and fulfilled lives, make informed decisions, and respond to local and global challenges. So there's a little bit of consistency with what we just saw previously, but there's also a little bit of nuance. All right, not to be outdone, I asked, we've talked a lot about ChatGPT and AI today, so it's actually a great coincidence that uh, I asked ChatGPT about what is whole child education, and here's what ChatGPT has to say. So whole child education is an approach to education that emphasizes the development of all aspects of a child's being, including academic, social, emotional, and physical well-being. This approach recognizes that children are complex beings who require a holistic approach to their education that goes beyond teaching academic subjects. Whole child education seeks to create a supportive learning environment that addresses the needs of the whole child. It aims to provide opportunities for students to develop their critical thinking skills, creativity, and problem solving, as well as their emotional intelligence, empathy, and social skills. This approach to education also recognizes the importance of physical health and wellness, and seeks to provide opportunities for students to engage in physical activity and healthy habits that promote well-being. Overall, whole child education seeks to prepare students for success, not only in their academic pursuits, but in their personal and professional lives by fostering their development as well-rounded individuals. So across these definitions, uh, what are some things that you hear, and you can respond if you want here in the room, what are some things that you hear in terms of commonalities? Um, Cognitive and non-cognitive skills. Excellent. Any, anything else that sticks out to anybody? That's all right. Cognitive and non-cognitive is nice and broad. You can fit a lot of things in there. Uh, so here's, here's what's interesting. More than, more than academic skills, it's, it's about broader well-being. It's well-roundedness. Um, and in many ways, it's that last sentence of chat GPT. It kind of captures some key elements that a whole child education seeks to prepare students for success, not only in the academic pursuits, but in their personal professional lives by fostering development as well-rounded individuals. So notwithstanding the professional lives for children bit here, um, which that kind of clearly illustrates that uh, AI still has some work to do because I'm not sure kids have professional lives just yet. Uh, what we're really talking about here when we think about whole child uh, is the idea of human flourishing. And if we're going to sort of cannonball into the waters of a whole child approach and buy into the idea of human flourishing, what we have to recognize is that whole child models are about more comprehensively personalizing the educational setting so that it responds to individuals 
interests, students' interests and needs in the context of their home and the community with an overarching goal of supporting the student's achievement, their attainment, and their behavior. And so to achieve those ends, a type of whole child education model that was created by Linda Darling Hammond and, and her colleagues in a privacy uh, policy brief a number of years ago on whole child schools is that schools need to attend to four major domains to be sort of whole child focused. So first, uh, whole child schools build a positive school and climate in classrooms and schools that promote strong attachments and relationships. The school climate has a strong sense of effective caring, trust and connections among staff and families and a learning environment where the student's sense of identity is safe. And can I just say, this is one of the themes that came across so strongly today in my tour was that teachers were engaged with the students. They cared about the students. In fact, when I was uh, being uh, sort of uh, chaper chaperoned uh, <laughs> to the different, which is probably right, that right, you want a safe environment, so I should be chaperoned as sort of a stranger here. Um, as I was going from classroom to classroom, there was, a, there was a discussion around like, we want to build a trusting environment, a caring environment. And really that exudes from everything that I saw today. You all are really hitting that mark really well. So that was incredibly impressive. So that's, that's one aspect of a school or a system that's emphasizing a whole child approach uh, is by having that sort of safe environment for children. A second characteristic of a whole child cl climate is where schools will develop instructional strategies that support motivation, uh, that facilitates self-directed learning, and schools that are strong in this area are characterized by teachers who are connecting material to student experiences in order to facilitate student-centered instruction. Again, in the very short time that I was going classroom to classroom, there was discussion around, well, here's how teachers are looking to be able to connect with students' cultural backgrounds. And so when we think about different holidays that different students are celebrating, we're trying to connect that to the instruction of the day. And I was like, this is great. Your school is doing everything that's in my talk today. So maybe I don't, well, I'll give the talk for the benefit of the virtual learners because everyone else here is already doing a lot of these things. I promise there's going to be some interesting things because if you're already saying, duh, this is what we do. Well, that's all right. There's going to be a little bit more for you. Uh, so a third component of this particular whole child model is that schools shape positive student behaviors through social emotional learning that we've talked quite extensively about this afternoon, even this morning. And here, the, the authors that created this model, they talk about positive mindsets, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, the, the schools will create a, a, a climate that facilitates strong self-regulation. So the ability for a child to be able to sort of take their own behavioral temperature, so to speak, and to be able to manage themselves accordingly. Uh, and also resilience. Uh, that's a, an aspect of shaping positive student behavior is thinking about encountering difficult circumstances and being able to flourish in spite of those things. And all of that characterizes social emotional learning in the system. Lastly, uh, a whole child climate is one that creates the individual supports that address student needs with a particular emphasis on the effect of trauma and adversity. Now, what's interesting about this model is that a core or foundational aspect of what led the authors to actually build out this specific whole child framework is that adversity affects learning and the way that schools respond matters. That is their core thesis. That's what helps them think about how to build out the entire whole child model and these four specific components is that we're really trying to address adversity. And so we're going to return to this idea shortly, but what's important to pull from this model is that the authors and those like them in the space of whole child reform are in many ways saying, if we're gonna have effective learning environments, and I want to say that's not just schools, that's home, that's communities, that we need to be attentive to trauma and adversity that a child is bringing to the classroom. And if we're going to talk about the environments or systems in which children learn with schools, homes and communities, then we need to acknowledge that not all systems have an equal influence on a child's reading development. So, for example, ecological systems, uh, they model child development as a framework that looks at different systems and sources of individual differences that impact child development. So this model that you see here is one of the most prominent types 
of ecological models that was created by a scientist named Yuri Bronfenbrenner. So anyone that's taken an intro to psychology class, you, you're probably remembering when, or have repressed that name. Uh, but it's one of the, this is one of the most prominent frameworks in psychology that explains the impacts of different systems on human development. And so these types of ecological models, they suggest that development occurs through a series of interactions between the individual who's located at the center and then these other systems that exist outside of the child. And, and the influence of these contexts is really hierarchical uh, in degree of influence from something like the microsystem, which is the closest to the child. So the closer a system is to the child, the higher or stronger the impact is on their development. And then it goes all the way out to the macro system, which is the furthest away from the child and then has sort of the least direct impact on child development. So a micro system can be thought of as, as including the home, the school, uh, neighborhood environments where process is pivotal to learning to read and overall child development take place. Uh, the, the next layer out from the microsystem is the mesosystem. And the mesosystem is one that defines interactions between microsystems. So that's what are the interactions that occur between a home and a neighborhood, a neighborhood and a school, a home and a school. Then you have the exosystem that sort of contains indirect influences on individuals, and that's inclusive of things like social services, health care, parental employment. And lastly, you have the macro system, which is the broader uh, social and cultural context that sit outside of the other systems. Now, with regard to reading, the ecological model here helps us think about how kids are acquiring proficiency in reading, and that it's gonna be impact and impacted by a number of factors, including uh, genetic and biological influences, behavioral influences, and done so between direct and indirect means. And by examining the impact of these different factors, both individually and in concert with one another, we may be able to understand better while some children struggle with learning how to read beyond the things that are already known. And so there have been uh, numerous formulations of these kinds of ecological models, all of which recognize these various types of systems that directly and indirectly impact the person at the core of the model. Now, this is a model. It's not important to, to, to read the words because, uh, yeah, I can barely read it and, I'm, and it's right there. But, but this is a type of ecological model that looks at mental health and well-being of an individual so from a systems approach. So. We don't need to know all the levels or all the descriptors, but what it's showing, similar to the broad ecological model that I just showed, is that it's describing systems and indicators specific to mental health. So in the way that the previous ecological model provided sort of a broad frame of different types of systems that may impact an individual, this is a model that is attempting to localize an ecological model for the purpose of thinking about mental health and well-being. And so similar to that last model, at the core of this, you have an individual. And right by the individual, you, it has descriptors such as coping skills, adaptability, and stress response. So the previous slide, we had the individuals impacted by home, community, school. Here we have the individual is impacted by coping skills, adaptability, and stress response. Those are the things that are closest to the individual that is impacting their mental health and well-being. The next layer out shows that the relationship the individual has with family, with peers, with other social connections, and the extent to which those types of relationships are nurturing has the next direct kind of influence on the individual, but also an indirect influence through their coping skills. So to the extent that a person's relationship with their parents, with their friends is nurturing, helps to either reinforce in a facilitative way or potentially debilitative way in terms of the individual's mental health. So you get the idea that the, the closer these things are to the individual, the more of a direct impact uh, is occurring on the individual uh, with their well-being and their overall flourishing. So the point here is that in an ecological theory approach, there are varied influences. There are they are direct and indirect. They are relational and experiential. They are close to and far from the child. And all of these things are impacting the center of a whole child. 
And those things will either facilitate or be debilitative in terms of the nurturing of the academic, cognitive, physical, psychological, social, emotional development of a child. And that is a lot to consider. And so here we kind of pause. Um, and it's probably wise to ask ourselves, what do all these models have to do with reading development and interventions and screening? I'm glad you all asked that. That was a really, that was a really good question. Uh, so we're, we're seeing an increase in the literature, uh, in the publication of papers talking about risk and resilience models in the science of reading. And so scientists, including these folks, uh, among others, have been publishing on risk and resilience applied to reading development. And I think it's important to compare and contrast a bit uh, the differences between the ecological models I just showed and risk and resilience frameworks, partly because the ecological models have been around for forever. I don't know how many decades, but many, many decades. Risk and resilience models are sort of an outworking and more of a localization, even where they're different from ecological models. The risk and resilience is partly born out of that tradition in many ways. So similar to the ecological model, uh, a risk and resilience framework considers the different types of influences on child development. So the ecological model has the individual at the center, there's all the different systems outside of it, and they all directly or indirectly impact the child. But the further you are away, right, the more indirect that effect is. But what's different about a risk resilience model compared to the ecological model is that risk resilience looks at the weight or the balance of factors for each individual child. And so maybe stated differently, uh, the ecological models, they generally suggest, again, the farther away the system is from the child, the less it impacts a child compared to a system that's closer. So the home and the schools and the micro system have a greater weight on child development compared to the macro system. So political and economic systems, they matter, they impact not as much as home and school. Uh, it, but a risk resilience framework says any factor from any system from any level can be a direct shaping force on a child, but it's not just that these systems may impact from a risk factor or from a vulnerability factor approach, but there can be a positive adaptation despite the exposure to a threat that may present from any particular system. And so ecological models don't frame um, child development as a weighing of individual factors per se. They're about sources of influence, but a risk resilience framework has to identify really both indicators of risk and indicators of resilience that support a child's ability to be able to adapt in the presence of a threat. And so I think there's two reasons why we see sort of the proliferation of risk resilience models in the science of reading. Uh, first is that there is a strong evidence base about the kinds and types of risk factors that lead to reading difficulties. We talked about that this morning and even a bit this afternoon, this evening. So thinking about deficits in phonological skills, thinking about deficits in language skills, there is a large evidence base about how those uh, deficits lead to poor reading outcomes. And so it's clear that there are many individual risk factors. Uh, these risk factors often co-occur, and the presence of multiple risk factors increases the likelihood of reading difficulties. A risk and resilience model uh, allows for the presence of single or multiple risk factors, but it also allows for the resilience factors. And so the second reason I think we see more of these models emerge is because we really need to study, we really need to talk more about the kinds of things that are promoting or facilitating educational flourishing of kids. And so in this paper that Nicole Patenteri led uh, with her co-authors, uh, she wrote this and I quote, uh, risk and resilience models, they identify multiple factors that may promote protect or prevent child competence in reading and reading related skills, noting that although children and families may encounter similar risks, the processes through which they experience those risks may differ in substantive ways that can inform approaches to address achievement in schools. And so what I think this means for us is that when we as scientists uh, move from a risk only model that may uh, suggest that a child has a phonological awareness deficit and so we must intervene, which is right and good. But when we move from that to embrace a risk and resilience framework that may say, yes, a child has a phonological deficit, but here are some resilience factors to consider as well. We're confronted with the challenge that our questions shouldn't necessarily be so narrow 
to focus on what works, to think about remediation of phonological deficits, but what works for whom under what conditions, to acknowledge that there are deficits and there are strengths, there are contexts, and these are kids. And we need to consider all of those different aspects when thinking about remediation and support for a child's reading development. And that's a call, I think, for both assessment creators that are thinking about early identification of at-risk readers, as well as inter interventionists and curriculum developers who are looking at how to best educate a child. We may need to be considering not just the risk factors of reading, but, but resilience. And this call is important because uh, there, was, there was the Society for Research on Child Development. Uh, they have an ethnic and racial issues committee. They rightly noted when thinking about risk and resilience factors that when you look at resilience factors and not just risk and consider ecological models and not just content-based models, researchers are challenged to look at why minoritized children are consistently underachieving compared to their peers and how the systemic processes outside the individual may produce negative outcomes for some kids, but not others. And then to further look at the kinds of resilience factors that especially children of color demonstrate despite encountering conditions that might make them vulnerable to reading difficulties. So with all this talk about ecological models and risk and resilience models, what might a risk and resilience model related to reading look like? So this is uh, one model that Q Katz and I uh, published on last year in the Journal of Learning Disabilities. And here we tried to capture some of the common risk factors on the left-hand side that may increase the probability of an individual having a difficulty learning to read, things like phonological deficits, language impairments, uh, attentional deficits, visual problems, trauma, and stress. But then on the right-hand side, we have resilience factors that could buffer the effect of risk. Things like good instruction, growth mindset, task-focused behavior, family peer support, adaptive coping strategies. Taken together, these various risk and resilience factors are proposed to work together in this complex and nonlinear fashion to influence kids' trajectories in their reading. And so at this point, I want to highlight two particular components of this proposed model that may seemingly hold promise for us that have been uh, historically understudied and are emerging in terms of our understanding of their role in reading development. And that's talking about a little bit about growth mindset and then a little bit about trauma and stress. But before I do that, uh, I'm going to do the promised rabbit trail. Uh, so now that I've covered a little bit of terrain around whole child ideas, whole child models and some considerations, I want to jump just for this kind of quick detour for a refresher on the science of reading, um, but more specifically on the simple view of reading, because I think if we're going to think, so that I guess that's thinking about how we think, so a meta, if we're going to get metacognitive for a few minutes um, about how risk and resilience might have relevance to the science of reading, it's helpful to talk about what the evidence suggests right now related to the simple view of reading. So for those who want that quick refresher, uh, the simple view of reading basically says that learning to read consists of developing skills in two critical areas. One, I think it's on the, is that on the left-hand side? Left-hand side, my rights and lefts get mixed up. One on the left-hand side, so one is reading words and text both accurately and fluently, and then the other skill is comprehending the meaning of what's being read. And for kids to read words accurately and fluently, they need to build strategies in order to read words they haven't seen before in print, as well as words they've previously encountered. And then for them to understand the meaning of words, students or kids must have sufficient language comprehension skills. So if the text here said the little dog barked at the big cat, a proficient reader must be able to read each word accurately and also know what the words mean in the specific sentence. And I think as anyone here can attest, accurate and fluent word reading is complex. It requires the integration of visual skills, of auditory skills, of cognitive skills. So when reading the word cat in this sentence, the child has to see each letter. They have to be able to produce the sound of each letter. They have to put those sounds together to produce the word cat. And as the child becomes more familiar with the word cat, their, their fluency or their speed of an accurate response improves. And over time, reading words accurately with increased fluency helps set the stage for figuring out what the text means. But again, that accurate word reading is just one part of the equation. To understand the example sentence about dogs and cats, the, the child must also know what dogs and cats are. Uh, they have to know what bark means. 
They need to understand that little and big refer to size concepts. Uh, and background knowledge can also assist in comprehension. So understanding will be improved if a child knows something about why a dog might bark at a cat, uh, which the sentence doesn't say explicitly. And students might also sense the irony of a little dog uh, barking at a big cat, uh, which is kind of fun. So what's great is that this simple view of reading, it's been empirically tested and replicated hundreds, if not thousands of times with millions of children in scientific research. And what we consistently find is that the simple view of reading, it does a good job as a model that looks to explain why kids differ in their comprehension skills. And there's a variety of researchers doing that have done amazing work on the simple view of reading, everyone from Barbara Foreman to Chris Lonigan, Young Sook Kim, Yusra Ahmed, David Francis. They've all done different papers looking how at either a simple view or sometimes what's called a not so simple view of reading. Uh, how well does it explain why individuals differ in their reading outcome scores? And, and again, the literature generally converges on the idea that simple view of reading statistically is a good, but it's not a perfect model. We really shouldn't expect it to be. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, my, my doctoral advisor, Chris Schatzneider, and he used to say it often. This was from uh, Box, Box and Someone from 19, I think it's like 1920 or 1921. Uh, All statistical models are wrong. Sometimes they're useful. And so what's helpful about this is that when we think about the simple view of reading and we look at how well the evidence is converging, is the model entirely right? No, but we shouldn't expect it to be. So what does the science say when it comes to the simple view? So ideally, what, what would be great is we would know it all, right? It would be settled in science about what we do for every kid under every condition when teaching them how to read. We would know everything about their circumstances. We would know about their risk factors, resilient factors. We know perfectly if we do this, then this will happen. And so this graph kind of crudely illustrates maybe the ideal that if we take the entire population of kids in the world and, and run our statistical model, that the simple view of reading could explain 100% of the variance, right? So if we test kids in their reading comprehension, uh, if we give an assessment of word reading and an assessment of language to predict their comprehension, it might be ideal that those two measures of word reading and language are sufficient to explain 100% of why kids differ in their reading scores. But here's the reality, it doesn't. These are the results from uh, two different studies. And again, there are many studies. These are just two examples, one led by Bar Barbara Foreman and I with some of our colleagues at FCRR and another study by uh, Jamie Quinn and, and Rick Wagner who are also at FCRR. And so in the Foreman study, we studied 3000 students in grades one through 10. And we administered multiple measures of reading comprehension, multiple measures of word reading and language and we wanted to look at how much of the variance in comprehension was due to reading and language. And what, what you can see in, the, in this table is that at grade four and above, the simple view of reading statistical model does a really good job of explaining why reading comprehension scores differ in the sample, right? And so the differences in reading are just about fully explained by differences in word reading and language. 98% in fourth grade, 99% in fifth and sixth grade and ninth and 10th grade. So using the simple view of reading in these upper grades does an excellent job of helping us understand why kids differ in their reading comprehension scores. But in grades one to three, you can see in many ways, we explain a lot of variance. So 59% in second, 68% in first, 78% in third. But in other ways, there's still a lot that isn't explained. Now separately, uh, Jamie Quinn and Rick Wagner, they found 155 published studies looking at the simple view of reading. And those 155 studies included 1.2 million individuals from ages four to 46. So this is a very large sample that they're analyzing. And what they did was they collapsed the ages to those who were less than 11 years old and then uh, greater than 11 years old. So about, so that's about sixth grade uh, or below sixth grade and above sixth grade. And what they found is that across all of these individuals, across all these studies, the, the measures of word ring and language on average explained 61% of the differences in reading comprehension for younger students and 53% in older students. Now, there's a lot of statistical alchemy, um, which I love, but I'll probably spare you um, in terms of what the implications of these results are. But a reason I provide these illustrations is that here's what's left that's statistically unexplained. In grades one to three for the Foreman study, 
we didn't explain between 22 and 41 percent of the difference in reading outcomes. And in the Quinn and Wagner study of 1.2 million kids, there's about 40 percent left unexplained for our younger developing readers. So when we think about risk and resilience factors, yes, phonological and language deficits are critical and core to our understanding why kids may differ uh, in their reading and what's leading to uh, low reading outcome scores. And there's a strong literature base on what we can do instructionally and through interventions to support increasing reading development. But at the same time, given these results, we may have an opportunity to understand more about what explains differences in reading by including other kinds of risk and resilience factors into our statistical models. All right, so after that kind of brief detour, um, I want to talk a bit about growth mindset and trauma as part of a risk resilience model in a whole child framing. So just to get a sense, who here has read a book, uh, heard a story, used materials about growth mindset in the classroom or at home? All right. Oh, boy, this is this is great. All right. A whole bunch of people. So let's do this. I'm sorry for the virtual folks. I can't I can't see your hands if you're raising them, but you can you can raise your hands anyway. That's all right. Uh, OK, so let's do so by a quick show of hands. Um, let's do this. For those who are here, close your eyes because I, I don't want to call anybody out. Um, who believes that you can grow in your intelligence? Just raise your hand if you believe you can grow in your intelligence. OK, who believes that you can't grow in your intelligence? All right, everyone can open their eyes. All right, so there's, so there's some variability there, that, that's nice. So according to mindset theory, individuals vary in their beliefs about whether you can or can't grow in your intelligence. Individuals who believe their intelligence can't change and, and that intelligence is stable, it, that's considered to be a fixed mindset. Whereas those who believe intelligence can change have what's called a growth mindset. And according to mindset theories and uh, the mindset theorists, uh, fixed mindset is detrimental for a lot of real world outcomes, whereas a growth mindset leads to lots of positive outcomes, uh, including according to, this is according to the creators of mindset theory, not me, but a growth mindset is maybe related to weight loss and achieving peace in the Middle East. <laughs> uh, different sides of distribution, I have the references, I can send them to you. Um, I'm not making that up. So, uh, so a, a little bit, maybe lower hanging fruit for us, is that mindset theory suggests or may suggest that students with higher growth mindset may be able to adapt better or have a more positive response to uh, deficits in reading or math skills, which may lead to greater academic achievement compared to those with fixed mindset. So the theory suggests as well that interventions designed to increase students' growth mindset, it will lead to uh, greater academic achievement. So uh, in 2018, uh, scientist Victoria Sisk and her colleagues, they published a paper that was a meta-analysis of all published studies on growth mindset. Uh, and here's the thing, just an, another quick detour, meta-analysis, a meta-analysis of experimental data or a meta-analysis of randomized control trials, that's um, probably the strongest form of evidence you can provide about something or not working. So we have this thing about like tiers of evidence where uh, not all forms of research are equal in terms of how we think about the weight or importance of what we observe in sort of reported phenomena. So, you know, at the bottom where you have like opinion papers, letters, case reports, this is kind of like um, if you watch a random TikTok about someone saying they saw something work, that's sort of the lowest form of evidence. Uh, <laughs> don't do what they said to do, unless they're baking a really cool cake and they have very specific ingredients, but that's actually empirical. Um, so if, if you're just stumbling across a video or someone says, I saw this for this individual, that's a lower form of evidence. And as you get to uh, the upper part of this triangle and this hierarchy, we get more rigorous evidence. And you can see uh, this, there we go right there. Um, historically, what we've talked about is that randomized control trials uh, provides the best evidence of what works. But that's been superseded in the last 10 or 20 years about meta-analyses of randomized control trials. So you get the highest form of evidence in terms of thinking about unbiased effects and thinking about uh, efficacy, but it's actually not that. It's do that multiple times and then have someone take all of the results of that and analyze it. So that's why it's a meta-analysis. You take the result from multiple studies, you analyze it and say, well, what's the average effect across all these studies? 
All right, so uh, this is from Victoria Sisk and her colleagues' paper looking at growth mindset. And so I wanna orient you to, to this gift that may be sort of harder to see maybe smoothly for those who are virtually attending. Uh, so on the left-hand side is a listing of 273 studies that they included in their meta-analysis, looking at, at least in, in this particular set of figures, they're looking at the correlation between growth mindset and academic achievement. So you have the list of the studies that are sort of being shown across these four different iterations. On the far right of the slide, you can see, uh, actually it's on the bottom, you can see uh, there, there's a, a range of scores going from minus one to one. And so on the far right, the one means that growth mindset is perfectly and positively related to academic achievement. So that increases in mindset towards a very strong growth mindset explains all the differences in academic achievement. That's what, that's what it would be if you were at a one. If you were at a minus one, which is all the way to the left, it means that weaker growth mindset um, also perfectly predicts academic achievement, but the other direction. So if you're all the way to the right, it's increases in growth mindset lead to higher achievement. If it goes to the left, it's lower growth mindset leads to higher achievement. The middle line is zero. And so that middle straight line is basically saying there is no relation between academic achievement and growth mindset. And then each of those dots are the actual correlations from each of the 273 studies. And what you can see is that as this visual is progressing, the dots are systematically moving from the right to the left. So across these 273 studies, the correlations differ quite widely from positive and negative. And if you average all of those dots, because they took all the correlations from all the studies, the average correlation between uh, growth mindset and acad academic achievement is 0.1. That, that, that is, that is uh, about close to zero as you can get. It is a very weak relation between academic achievement and growth mindset, which is a fairly stark outcome compared to the popularity of growth mindset as a construct. But what about interventions? And so within that same study, they looked at 50 randomized control trials of growth mindset that was inclusive of 50,000 subjects. And they found, similar to the correlation that I just showed, they, they showed that the average effect size for growth mindset interventions was 0.09. Now, to make that plain, if you were to uh, take a treatment group and take a control group, recognize their performance and academic achievement uh, as circles and create sort of a Venn diagram where you would hope that if the treatment was effective, those groups would be different. We can recognize differences in academic achievement for those who got a growth mindset intervention, their growth mindset's higher versus those that didn't. So in the Venn diagram, these authors are basically saying it's a circle. There are no differences between the treatment group and the control group. On average, uh, there's no effect of these interventions that make the groups different on academic achievement, despite the claims from many scientists that are saying that growth mindset interventions work and that growth mindset is an important construct for us to consider. But this is not all doom and gloom. OK, so all studies have limitations and there's some important ones for us to consider here. So first, all of these intervention studies and all of these correlation studies, by and large, they focus exclusively on adults in adolescents, not younger children. Uh, second, they often look at GPA or standardized end of year assessments and not reading. Third, they often don't look at or haven't looked at at risk readers. They don't look at sex differences. They don't look at race differences. Uh, and so if we go back to the whole child framework, if we think about maybe growth mindset being a type of resilience factor where even where students are facing adversity, from different factors and poor reading, uh, might we see whether growth mindset can serve as a type of resilience factor when we look specifically at reading outcomes in younger children and take into account important factors like sex and race? That's a, that's a leading question. Uh, so uh, I wanna talk about results from a study that my colleagues and I did, so don't run out of the room screaming just yet, or for those who are participating, don't close the laptops just yet. Uh, unless you have other things to do. You can show this to your kids and create a story if that will help them sleep, that's okay. Uh, we're gonna get through this together. So uh, this figure is from a study of 200 elementary students who had poor reading scores as part of the inclusion criteria. So we published this paper in the Scientific Studies of, of Reading in 2018, I believe. And so in this study, we collected data from 200 students who, as part of participating in the study, they needed to be below the 30th percentile uh, on a reading comprehension measure. So these are at-risk readers with poor 
reading performance. And for these students with lower than average reading scores, we measured their growth mindset from a general perspective. Do you believe you can grow in your intelligence sort of writ large? But then we also asked about what the student believed about their intelligence related to reading itself. So we asked about mindsets. We asked about uh, we gave them assessments on reading comprehension and word reading measures and vocabulary measures. And what we found is that students growth mindset uniquely explained 15 percent additional variance of why students differed in their reading after accounting for their word reading scores. Now, consider just for a second what I showed a few slides back about the simple view of reading. Right? Word reading and language explain a large portion of the variance in reading comprehension, but not all of it. So that in a sample of higher risk readers, we could explain 15 percent additional variance in reading scores beyond what their incoming reading is, was a pretty important finding that was suggesting that growth mindset may serve as a protective factor for at-risk readers. But this is just an individual difference of study. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, why isn't vocabulary in this model? We can talk afterwards. I can, or I can give you the paper. Uh, it explains why, why it's not reflected in this model, but it is kind of there. So the fact that we're finding 15% additional variance explained is an important facet for us to consider when thinking about individual differences in reading. But what happens if we think about intervening on growth mindset while also thinking about intervening on reading for at-risk readers? So in a study that uh, Rachel Donegan led from a grant that uh, Jeannie, Alate uh, Jeannie Wanzik and Steph Alateba and Chris uh, Lemons and I have, we looked at randomly assigning students to a reading intervention uh, as well as a reading intervention plus, plus a growth mindset intervention and then also sort of a business as usual, just what's happening generally in the classrooms. Uh, and so the kids who were in the uh, reading intervention only were getting the LIPS uh, program, Linda Mood, the Linda Mood uh, word reading intervention. So it's designed to strengthen reading skills, particularly those with sort of weak word attack skills. So uh, the kids in that intervention got that only. Uh, students assigned to what we called MLIPS, uh, they got the LIPS intervention, plus they got the mindset intervention from Brainology. Uh, and it's just something that helps to explain the differences between growth mindset and fixed mindset strategies for um, undertaking academic challenges. And so what we wanted to do specifically in this paper is we wanted to understand what may work for whom under what conditions. And so our analyses were specifically looking at the intersection of race and sex and what kind of a mindset students had at the beginning of the study to see whether there were any differences in reading uh, for those kids who received mindset and reading intervention compared to the business as usual. So I want to show you some of the results, but it's probably helpful to orient you to this chart as well. So on the bottom here is where we have six different groups. And so these are just some codes that I'll unpack for you. So B is for uh, looking at black students, M is for male, F is for female, L is to represent kids who had low initial growth mindset. So at the beginning of the study, these are kids who tended to have a fixed mindset. A is an average growth mindset, H is high growth mindset. So we're going to talk about uh, to what extent did these individuals who received growth mindset and reading intervention differ from their counterparts in the business as usual. On the on the y axis here, we have effect sizes. This is a standardized effect size uh, here. It ranges from zero to one point four. And for a little bit of context, like 0.2 is historically considered small. Uh, this threshold right here is considered sort of a moderate effect. This is considered a large effect. So we're not going to get into the relevance of those criteria other than 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. That's sort of small, medium and large. And here's what we found across the board. We found moderate or small to large, practically important effects for individuals who are getting a growth mindset intervention with a reading intervention. And so particularly for the black males and the black females in the study, for those individuals who received reading intervention plus growth mindset, they outperformed their counterparts who were not receiving the specific reading intervention with a growth mindset. Not only that, but we found systematic effects for pairing growth mindset and reading interventions when looking at non-black females, and these were pri primarily white females. Uh, so you can, the effect sizes ranged here from about 0.3 to 0.5. So again, small to moderate effects when we find the combination of a growth mindset intervention paired with a reading intervention is leading to higher reading scores. Now, who didn't the pairing of mindset and reading work for? It was primarily non-black males. So these are the primarily white males in the study. Uh, and in fact, the effects here are negative. 
And so what we see emerging from this, one of the first papers of research looking at the effect of reading interventions from an intersectionality perspective is that growth mindset, even where it may not be changeable for samples that are sort of the on average, like in the CISC and colleagues meta-analysis, we're seeing it from a perspective of what works for whom under what conditions was showing that for children of color, they may benefit and females may benefit when not just reading is supported, but so is their growth mindset. And given what we're seeing here in the intervention context for growth mindset changes, there may be promise for thinking about whole child screening as well that includes the growth mindset perspective. So what about trauma? Okay, trauma is, as many people here may know, trauma is a complex phenomenon that has a wide range of meanings, um, experientially, definitionally, clinically, and otherwise. And it's probably no surprise that the recognition of and role of trauma in human development and human experience has significantly increase in our use of the word. Uh, I love Google Ngram, and so it's just this search engine that charts word frequencies from print dating back to 1500 all the way through basically now. And so the, the, tool, uh, the tool generate charts kind of looking at a word's yearly appearance by the number of words that are, that are in a corpus. And so what you can see here is that there has been a rapid acceleration in the use of the word trauma since 1990 and especially since 2000. And so here's what we know just in terms of basic statistics about trauma exposure. Over 60% of children experience at least one form of direct trauma exposure related to maltreatment, interpersonal violence, assault, or criminal activity before age of 18. And early exposure to traumatic events can have adverse effects on children's ability to function in their families, in their schools, their communities. Uh, trauma event exposure in children is associated with lower IQ, impaired working memory, delayed language skills, and lower academic achievement compared to non-exposed peers. And the interesting thing is that um, childhood traumatic stress often presents in a classroom as poor attention, lack of impulse control, and emotional dysregulation. I would wonder how many teachers here have observed that in any of your kids in the classroom. Now, if 60% of kids may experience some type of trauma, and a primary symptom of trauma is poor attention or emotional dysregulation, then what we may be observing at times in their behavior is not just poor behavior, it may be a stress response to some type of previous trauma exposure in their life. And so similar to what we did at the outset of the presentation of talking about um, whole child, it may be helpful to spend just a few minutes talking about what trauma is. And so very broadly, trauma, um, traumatic experiences can often be classified three ways. So there's acute, chronic, and complex traumas. Uh, so in acute trauma, um, that's, uh, that's what a, when a child occurs or witnesses an isolated attack of violence. So that might be like uh, being in a car crash, uh, some type of like animal attack, witnessing uh, some kind of injury or death. Um, a, cr a chronic traumatic event, um, that includes ongoing experiences or exposure to trauma, such as living in the home where there's interpersonal violence. And complex trauma exposure is the experience of prolonged and interpersonal traumatic offense, uh, events that occurs early in life, things like emotional abuse and neglect. Now, here's what's important about these three trauma types. There's a focus on the individual, there's a focus on the event, and there's the individual subsequent reaction to the event. So the acute trauma is an isolated event witnessed by a person. Chronic trauma is ongoing exposure. Complex is prolonged interpersonal violence. And so the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration tried to bring some clarity by de defining trauma from this generalist perspective that I've had up here. And what's helpful in using this definition is we can actually distill it down a bit further to the equation that's sort of on the right hand side. An individual's trauma is the sum of an adverse event and their traumatic stress response. So trauma equals AE plus TSR. So if only an adverse event is measured, then the trauma response is missing from the equation and there may be a misrepresentation of the individual's response of the event. So it's insufficient to just know about the event. We need to know something about how the child interpreted that. So even where we might have a little bit of definitional clarity about what trauma may be, what's interesting is that there's still little consensus for what should be measured or how trauma should be measured in children. Should it be just behaviors? Should it be directly 
at the child level, working with them one-on-one -on -one with a clinical battery? Should it be a parent rating or a teacher rating? And as many schools look to be trauma-informed, there is a need for us to bring clarity. And if we don't do something on the measurement side, we actually run the risk of under-identifying students at critical periods during their development of crucial educational outcomes, especially things like literacy skills. And what the literature on school-based measurement of trauma shows is that there's actually a variety of means to get at uh, child-level trauma. So one common measurement is using just behavioral assessments to measure maladaptive behaviors. Um, and then what may happen is that a child with a pattern of maladaptive behaviors, when they're sort of repeatedly assessed, that may prompt a, a teacher or a parent referral for a more in-depth trauma and stress response battery. But then these behaviors are often remediated um, oftentimes through disciplinary processes, so this is coming from more of the adolescent literature, um, versus a trauma-informed care response. Uh, other measurement systems, as I mentioned, they use a clinical battery of assessments to identify whether the child may have a type of post-traumatic stress disorder. And gaining clarity on trauma measurement has implications for whole child supports in schools. So the Every Succeed Act actually has specific grants and state level policy recommendations and trauma informed care models for the implementation of trauma informed care approaches within schools for student support for school personal training. Uh, and as an outworking of these provisions, there is an increasing urgency for educational environments to become trauma informed. Now, we do see many districts across many states, uh, many states that are starting to use a multi-tiered systems of support model for trauma-informed care. And so multi-tiered approaches to trauma-informed care in schools, they, they use um, a whole school response to perform to provide trauma-informed supports to all students within the educational environment. And so at tier one, that typically involves some type of teacher training for trauma awareness. Um, at tier two, there's, there's group therapy. So when uh, the trauma awareness is insufficient to be able to think about how to approach the student, be able to work with the student, um, that the behaviors are on their sort of reading and math skills, the, the student can be pulled out for group therapies. And then at the highest level for tier three, there can be individualized treatments to provide a more comprehensive model of care to think about the mental health and well-being of the child. Now, while this system of support is helpful, what's interesting and what you don't see here, for anyone who's aware of multi-tiered systems of support writ large, what you don't see here is a universal screening component. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh -huh. But without a universal screening component, we have a gap in the ability to identify those kids who are in need of these supports. If we only start with teacher training for trauma awareness, we put the onus on the teacher. Uh, and I think you all have, a, have enough to do right now. So if we think about how to embed a universal screening problem, uh, process related to trauma that might help us better identify those kids who actually need interventions for mild or moderate trauma stress response. Now, at the same time, most states have a type of multi-tiered system of support process in place related to reading. We were just talking about this a few hours ago when thinking about dyslexia and when we think about symptomology and etiology, what's the best way to remediate? Well, oftentimes, well, Jeremy, Jeremy Misiak and Jack Fletcher uh, started sort of a discussion in their RRQ paper saying, do this in the context of MTSS. There was already a system for universal screening for uh, intensive interventions and for being able to think about uh, small group supports for kids with word reading deficiencies. And so that's an opportunity to be able to think about an intact structure that's already being used in many states across the US that we could use to serve kids with dyslexia. Uh, and so it, what's interesting is we, the, our sort of current state of supports is that we have a separate trauma MTSS model from a reading MTSS model, but given the prevalence of trauma and the increasing awareness of the kinds of supports children need, we have an opportunity to really get a grasp of how trauma and behavior and reading may intersect given the implementation of these kinds of multi-tiered supports in school that already exist, but they're not harmonized. And so maybe we can do a little bit of work to better understand those roles. Um, I do want to make a quick note just about trauma measurement. Um, what's interesting is that not only have relatively few studies uh, looked at the connection between sort of trauma exposure and literacy skills, that there isn't really sort of a convergence around how do we measure trauma. Um, one of the kinds of trauma measures that we've been seeing some increased use on is looking at uh, the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And so intergenerational transmission of trauma refers to the transfer of trauma-related symptoms and behaviors from one generation to the next. It's 
a, cr a complex process that's hypothesized to occur through a lot of different mechanisms. So maybe it's genetic, maybe it's parenting behaviors, maybe there are these cultural environmental factors that are getting transmitted as a function of trauma to the next generation. Um, you may have heard me say hypothesized. And the reason is that intergenerational tr uh, transmission of trauma, this is not, this is not a, set a settled science. Uh, this is something that's a, quite a bit more maybe in its infancy. It's under study. It's hypothesized. There are studies looking at more complex trauma. So one of the most prominent ideas thinking about intergenerational transmission of trauma has been around the Holocaust. And so when we think about how that has worked from generation to generation, it's an idea but we want to think about careful measurement and careful implications of what results may show us in order to sort of potentially advocate for measuring this kind of construct. But what we are seeing is that pediatricians and behavioral health professionals, they're increasingly using measures like the adverse childhood experiences, certainly the, the ACE, uh, in their clinical practice. And so the ACE is a questionnaire that consists of 10 questions that asks about the adverse experiences that they may have encountered uh, up until 18. And so that includes uh, abuse, whether that's emotional, physical, or sexual. Uh, it includes neglect, which can be emotional or physical as well. There can be household dysfunction, uh, which is inclusive of mental illness, substance abuse, divorce, and incarceration. And so through this, through this survey, pediatricians are using this more to be able to give them a sense of the potential impact of the presence of traumas from the parental level to then help them think about what may be happening or what impact there may be on a child's current development. So with all of that <laughs> as a foundation, we're, we're getting to some more, some more science here. Um, there, there's been an active partnership in the last five years called Reach Every Reader. And so this was a partnership among Harvard, uh, MIT, and FSU. And within this, we're, we think we have sort of a five-fold mission. And so we're looking at pre-K uh, and home and family engagement. We, we're trying to create resources for educators and family supports. We're thinking about collaboration and outreach. We're trying to create uh, new K3 interventions. And then we're looking to validate new systems of screeners and progress monitoring assessments for K3. And so Hugh Katz and I have been leading uh, the assessment development at FSU. And the goal of this is to not just have a conventional screener of thinking about dyslexia risk, but a robust assessment system that takes into account childhood experiences, thinking about culture, thinking about teacher and caregiver perceptions of their kids' behaviors, thinking about emotional well-being. We're trying to think about the role of intergenerational transmission of trauma by giving an ACE to kids' parents to understand a potential link between parents' trauma and their kids' reading. And then we're trying to do this in a way that, that is fast, that's reliable, that's useful, that we can provide um, child profiles of not just reading skills, but thinking about reading and behavior and at-home trauma and parents' involvement in their kids' education. So this is a five-year longitudinal study from kindergarten to third grade. We're measuring reading and language and RAN and working memory and other associated literacy skills. And through that, I want to talk a little bit about three different things that we're learning. So one is what are we learning about the relation among parental adverse childhood experiences, uh, their own parenting behaviors, and what then what does that look like in terms of their involvement in their child's education? Uh, second, I want to talk about parental ACE, uh, uniquely, you know, whether it's uniquely related to kids' reading outcomes. And then lastly, we'll talk about how does ACE measurement, how does behavioral measurement, how does growth mindset measurement, how might that improve screening accuracy? So first, thinking about the relation among uh, sort of parental trauma, parent behaviors, and their, their involvement in kids' education. So we collected data on about, uh, at the time, 400 parents uh, and their kids. And so we looked at this, what we wanted to do was uh, administer the ACE, we administered the uh, adult and adolescent parenting inventory, where there are three different skills that look at things like uh, the, the parents' expectations of children, whether you use corporal punishment in the home, some other factors. And then we also measured the uh, family involvement questionnaire, which looks at to what extent are parents involved in their kids' education at school? To what extent are they involved in their kids' education at home? And to what extent do parents talk with uh, school professionals and how engaged are they with their teachers and their administrators? So ACEs is that tr parental trauma measure. The AAPI one through three are the three different dimensions of parenting behaviors. And then SBI is uh, school-based involvement. HBI is, is home-based involvement. HSC is homeschool connections. And so what we found here um, is that there were six different groups of parents among those 300 sampled 
parents. Uh, and so in order to interpret this somewhat easily, high, so severe levels that were present in this as, as reflected by red. So if there was performance on the measure that was sort of in a, in a negative direction, that's indicative of sort of um, risk, something that's risky. This is color coded red. Blue means average. Green means uh, they're, it's, it's good. It's facilitative. It's fine. And so what we found here is that group one, they had the highest ACE score. Uh, they, they valued children's adherence to parents' needs. They valued parental uh, or kids' expectations, but they had the lowest involvement. And so what we see is that the group of parents that had the highest traumas they had the lowest involvement in their kids' education. You can see that groups two through five have different varying and varying levels of sort of facilitative behaviors um, or average levels of adverse experiences. But if we contrast that with group six, group six really looks like the flip of group one. So where group one, the parents reported the highest ACE scores, the most number of traumatic effects and had the lowest involvement in their kids' education. Group six had the fewest number of ACE and they had the highest involvement in their kids' education. And what's interesting about these results is, uh, and what's important here, is that these groups are not defined by race, sex, poverty, or parental education. And so sometimes there's prevailing notions or, or theories that uh, groups with high trauma is specifically related to poverty. So if you live in, uh, if you're in an underserved population that's high poverty, they're the ones that have the highest ACE scores. That's not true in this sample. We found that these groups cut across SES, sex, race, and parent education. So these are not fully explain, explained by background characteristics. And that's important because what we found is that when we compared the kids, uh, the kids in group one, their, the parents' children's fall kindergarten scores of reading and language, they were systematically lower compared to the kids of parents in group six by about a half standard deviation. That's a very large effect. So when we think about what are what did parents experience as children, how is that influencing their parent behaviors and how involved are they in their kids' education? We're seeing correlational data that's suggesting kids that are coming from homes where the parents experienced a lot of traumas, they're coming in at the beginning of kindergarten with systematically lower reading and language scores, and that's independent of poverty. We control for poverty in these models. We control for maternal education in these models. So there's something happening, potentially, when we think about these kinds of measures, that's helping us to better understand why kids differ in their reading and language scores beyond the simple view of reading. Maybe trauma has a role here, and maybe it's specifically an intergenerational transmission of trauma. Uh, second, and I'll cover this briefly, is to what extent does maybe parental ACE and, and maybe uh, kids' behaviors, does that relate uniquely to kids' outcomes? And so what we did in this study, this was done by my formal doctoral student, Lauren Stanley. Uh, this paper is under review right now, so I haven't really talked about this one too much. So these are some, these are some new findings. Um, and so what Lauren did in her dissertation was she did direct measurements um, of kids' trauma. So that UCLA PTSD measure and the CATS measure, those first two listed under measures, those are direct measures of kid traumas. So she administered, administered those to, I think it was 150, 150 kids. We also administered the parent ACE. We also administered the emotional competence, attentional problems, adaptability, and resilience uh, scales from the BASC. It's a behavioral rating assessment. So these are parent ratings of kids' behaviors in the home. So we have direct, trial, uh, direct trauma measurement of the child. We have parent ratings of, of their kids' behavior uh, at home. We also have direct measures of the child's blending and vocabulary skills at the beginning of the year. And then we also administered the parent ACE, similar to what we did in the study that I just reported. So we wanted to look at to what extent did an intergenerational transmission of trauma measure, to what extent did direct clinical assessments, to what extent did parent ratings of behaviors, how does that uniquely predict kids' end of year word recognition and word decoding? Green means in this model that the component was statistically significant. Red means it wasn't. And what we find is when we look at word recognition skills, after we account for blending in vocabulary, which those should be the primary predictors of kids' end of kindergarten word reading skills, those two things are positively related to word reading, but so is parental ACE. And so we're finding, uh, and I think it explains 6% additional unique variance. If we're trying to predict kids' end of year word reading, blending and vocabulary matter, but so did the measurement of the kids' parents' previous traumas. 
And in the same way, for word decoding, we find after controlling for other variables, blending is significantly related to the child's end of year word decoding, but so was the direct measure of child's, uh, the child's trauma. So there's a little bit of um, sort of a mix and match. In this case, we have two different outcomes with different things that are kind of relating. That happens a lot in scientific research. Uh, but what this is showing us is that there is a potential evidence base for us to consider. So when we come back to this risk and resilience model, um, and, and one that expands our understanding of the kinds of risk factors that may lead to reading difficulties, things like trauma, but then think about the kinds of things like a growth mindset that could serve as a resilience factor based on the emerging research we're finding, what do we do and where do we go? And importantly, what does that lead to in terms of screening? Uh, so to answer that, I want to talk for just a couple minutes about the state of screening. And so a lot of folks here may be uh, familiar with screening for dyslexia. A lot of you are probably administering those assessments, interpreting those assessments as teachers, uh, as a parent, maybe being befuddled by the reports that come for those assessments, but actually not parents here, because I learned all about how scores are talked about with parents, and it's a fantastic process you all here. So I think the parents here have a, probably a better understanding than a lot of us do when getting a score report. Uh, so at the time of sort of working through this presentation, uh, almost every state has some kind um, of legislation thinking about screening. So uh, 40 states in particular have passed legislation related to screening for dyslexia. Uh, about 40 states have passed legislation that are broadly related to reading difficulties, and that's in the context of MTSS, the multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, and there's a, a sort of an emerging trend of a lot of states replacing, replacing end-of-year standardized assessments with benchmarking progress monitoring. So there's, there's a lot of screening that's happening. But here's what's interesting. Um, legislation is, is not monolithic. Right? Okay. That screen is out, so it's hard for me to know kind of where I am. Sorry. Um, so when, when we look at what different states are implementing, um, so when it comes to uh, dyslexia specifically, it's, it's, it's actually 42. So it's 42 states that have universal screening, 28 that have instructional interventions, 28 states uh, require in-service professional development for practicing educators, 16 have pre-service training for aspiring educators. Guess how many out of all of these different aspects include all four of these components? Screening, intervention, in-service, and pre-service supports. It's eight. Eight's not, that's not good. That's not enough. Uh, <laughs> Oh, thanks so much for turning that one back on. Um, so these, these four different com components can in many ways be thought of as mechanisms um, that each influence student outcomes. So if you don't have screening, not all states have a requirement for screening. Uh, if you don't have screening, you miss the opportunity to find the kids that needed interventions. Not having interventions means that for the kids who are identified, they're not getting remediation. Uh, so there's a lot of variability in the kinds of uh, aspects of legislation that are being passed related to assessment an intervention. Um, but maybe if we say, well, there's a lot of variability in the types of legislation that's being passed, but certainly if we look within a type of legislation, there'd be sort of like more similarities. So if we just look at screening legislation, most states are probably doing the same thing. And then separately, if we look at interventions, probably most states are doing the same kind of thing for interventions. Maybe they don't have both screening and intervention, but they're going to be more similar to each other than not. So a group of researchers, including uh, Nancy Nelson, Brian Gear, and Hank Fien and I, we did a document analysis trying to understand differences in legislation. And I want to touch on just one part of what we found that has some implications. So when we look uh, across the states, uh, what we found is that actually with, within a given state, uh, screening generally uh, requires five or six different early literacy skills that need to be assessed. So at an individual state level, there might be five or six different things that are required. But when we take across all states, we have this particular taxonomy that shows states could be said that they're screening for as few as eight broad skills, which are word reading or written expression, phonological memory, oral language, comprehension, rapid naming, onset rhyme, family history. Those are eight broad level categories that the legislation encompasses. Um, but it could also be thought of that there are up to 23 specific abilities that are mentioned across the, all the states that have legislation for screening for dyslexia. Now, the most targeted abilities were phonological and phonemic awareness, uh, decoding, rapid naming, phonics, but there also were states that were saying kind of comprehension for kindergarten and family history. Now, what's good about this is that there's a lot of different things that could be measured. 
Uh, but what's bad about this is that there's a lot of different things that could be measured. And not all of these are on the same playing field in terms of their predictive strength. We shouldn't necessarily think that family history may be a fine indicator in some ways of being able to do early detection of kids who are at risk for protracted reading difficulties, but it shouldn't outweigh the measurement of phonological awareness or print knowledge. Those two things are not equal. But legislation is seemingly suggesting that any of these things that could be measured gives an equal opportunity for those types of assessments to be used. Uh, and even just from this brief analysis, that we can say even though screening is happening, it doesn't mean the same thing from state to state. And so not only is there consider variabil considerable variability in what is being recommended to screen with, there's a lot of variability in the definitions of dyslexia that are being adopted by states. There's a lot of variability in terms of who should be screened, like at what grade levels, when they should be screened, and how often. And so it becomes so complicated that we in fact have three different types of national centers that exist to be able to help states and districts and schools be able to make sense of all these different practices. We have the National Center for Systemic Improvement, the National Center on Intensive Interventions, the National Center on Improving Literacy, that all exist to be able to help us understand and use data wisely for identifying students who need the most supports. And part of the reason we have a lot of funding going to trying to help people understand how to use their data is because screening plot processes are all flawed and imperfect. And so even if you choose the best phonological awareness measure to be able to screen and administer it at the right time to the right kids, it's not going to correctly capture every child who needs supports, nor will it perfectly tell you who doesn't need supports. And this is actually a pretty common phenomenon with any kind of screener. So it doesn't matter if it's an eye chart at an optometrist's office or a medical biopsy, all screeners end up with something like this. So this is actually called, which is, it's hilarious, but this is called a confusion matrix. Um, yeah, that's the right response. Like, I don't know if statisticians have a awful or great sense of humor. And so in this confusion matrix, what you, what you have is in the column, you have two groups of individuals. You have those who actually have the problem and those who don't actually have it. So if we think about cancer, we have two groups, individuals who have cancer and individuals who don't have cancer. Uh, the rows here are trying to describe uh, the circumstance where you've created a test that tries to best screen for those who actually have the thing and those who actually don't. And when you administer a screener and you set a cut point to be able to define individuals from a screen as maybe being at risk for having it or not being at risk for having it, you actually get four kinds of scenarios. So in the upper left, you have the true positive. So I'm going to use, I'm going to keep going with cancer. So uh, in the situation where you actually have cancer and the screener tells you that you are at risk for cancer, that's a true positive. You have it. The screener picked up and said you have it. That's a correct hit. On the other side, you have on the lower right, which is a true negative. You don't actually have cancer and the screener says you don't have it. That's a correct decision. You truly don't have it. But then you have two types of errors. You have a false positive. That's where you don't actually have it but the screener says, yes, you do. And so that's an over-identification issue. You don't have the problem. The screener says you did, and so now something else happens. And then you have on the lower left, which is arguably probably the worst case scenario, is you actually have the problem, but the test didn't pick it up. The test said you're not at risk. The, the test for cancer said you don't have it, but you actually did. In schools, this would be a child is actually uh, at risk for having protracted word reading problems with the screener said, no, they're fine. And that child misses out on intervention services. Uh, and so there, this is sort of a lot to weigh right here. So uh, what might be helpful is for any of us who have traveled through LaGuardia or otherwise, uh, we can sort of understand true positive, true negatives sort of in this way. So, um, you know, again, for those that, who are watching, if they're still with us virtually or here. So how many folks have gone through uh, TSA they didn't have any metal in their pockets. They didn't have three ounces of liquid in their bags. And you went right through baggage check and the alarm didn't go off. How many people have had that experience? Right, most people, right? That's a, that's a true negative. You didn't, you didn't have it and you didn't get searched. Uh, how many, hmm, I don't know if we'll, we wanna go, but how many people have had um, some metal in their pocket or more than three ounces um, and also went through without getting detected? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a false negative, right? You actually had it, but you were missed by the screening process. Um, you also have how many have, have had it and it went off, right? 
that's a true positive. And then how many have had it where uh, you don't have any metal or liquid and the screen went off anyway? That's a false positive, right? So um, all screening processes have these kinds of flaws to them. And the known property of assessments is that you are always going to make errors. The issue is, what errors do you want to make less of? And like I mentioned a few minutes before, a higher false positive rate, it means uh, more students who may be eligible, there's more students who are gonna be eligible for intervention services because you have a higher percentage of individuals that are being flagged as being at risk when they didn't actually, they don't actually have a problem. That's a higher financial cost to the school for materials and for personnel. But a high false negative means you're missing the kids who actually need services. So these are, these are pros and cons that test makers have to weigh. Um, the reason that I bring this up is when we think about false positives and false negatives, a question could be, well, how prevalent is this with screening when especially thinking about screening for dyslexia? Uh, so these are some data that are coming from the National Center on Intensive Intervention. So the uh, NCII has a wonderful academic screening tool chart where you can find a list of assessments um, that do screening and early identification for kids who are at risk for reading difficulties. Uh, and it will, it will sort of subset and filter different screeners based on their classification accuracy, based on how long they take, based on what they measure in, types, in terms of types of skills. Many, if not most districts and states around the US use this as a way to be able to try to whittle down a larger extensive battery to a few that may be most appropriate for their schools. And so, uh, this is taking eight screeners, and I'm not naming them, um, so that if I were to filter out the assessments based on those that have data for the fall of kindergarten screening for word reading risk at the end of the year, there are eight screeners that have these kinds of false positive and false negative rates. So these are the, the only eight screeners on the NCII tool chart right now that qualify for doing screening according to their ratings and their rubrics. On average, if you take the mean across those eight assessments, on average, 21% of kids are over-identified and on average, 36% of kids are missed. That, in my estimation, is insufficient. And we shouldn't be okay with saying, if you look at the, if you look at the false negative rate on the right column, we shouldn't be content saying that we'll miss 74% or 29 or 42 or 27 or 56 percent of kids who needed service and that's just that's just the way it is so we can and we should do better and so the question is how um, so i think part of our answer may come from thinking about the role of ace uh, using ace scores as well as using behavioral measures to improve screening accuracy and so what I quickly want to do is show the findings from two different studies. So study one, we had 150 kindergarten kids where we collected um, phonological awareness and language measures at the beginning of kindergarten. We also administered uh, behavioral measures to parents asking them to rate their child's behaviors. We also measured the ACE as well. And then we measured kids' word reading skills at the end of the year, and we looked at a screening model. And we looked at how well a screening model predicted end of year word reading. And what we find is that on average, adding in trauma and behavior significantly improves our chances of finding the right kids, but in terms of the true positives and the true negatives. So if we were to use blending alone, we have a 77% chance of having correct classification. If we do vocabulary alone, it's 68%. But then if we add in behavior and trauma to a model that includes blending and vocabulary, we get up to 83%. And that's a big difference. The difference between 77 and 83 may seem small, but this is actually a, critical, a critically important component for us to consider that by asking parents about their own adverse experiences, uh, we may be able to gain more information about accurately identifying those kids who are in need of support. In the same way in study two, we administered in a separate sample of 250 kindergarten students, same process, give blending and vocabulary measures as well uh, as behavior and trauma to the parents to write their children's behavior on, measured end of year word reading. We found that by um, using letter sounds, vocabulary, growth mindset, behavior and trauma, we could get 96% accuracy in who we identify as who's at risk and who's not at risk. And if we think about those false positives and those false negatives, we can move from a model that says 74% are under-identified, 29%, 45, 56, 29. We can reduce that down to between 20 and 25%.
So even in this small study, we're starting to provide an evidence base that by getting a more robust purview, a, a broader framework of thinking about risk and resilience factors, we might be able to do a better job of identifying those kids who are truly at risk for poor reading difficulties. I'm going to jump over here because I'm getting assigned for time or was getting assigned for time. So I think that the, one of the implications for screening is that when we think about, again, these two different types of MTSS models, we have a greater opportunity to be able to harmonize the different processes that are in place for assessment and for instruction. So instead of having school social workers that are administering ACE measures as a part of a biopsychosocial intake and teachers or paraprofessionals who are administering reading screening uh, to, to kids in the classroom, we can be able to use the totality of that data to be able to improve not just identification rates, but then think about whole child supports. It's not just having siloed opportunities where social workers are going to work with the child in the home related to their emotional well-being and health, and teachers are going to be working on structure in the classroom. We can have more integrated data teams that are thinking about who the child is, what's happening at home. Maybe the parents can get some supports while the child is also getting appropriate supports. So what does this mean uh, for science? Very, very high level, because um, I want to get to the to the last slide that I think is maybe more helpful in some ways. Uh, so uh, a bunch of colleagues of mine, a bunch, I don't know if that's scientific, but that's what I'm going with at 8.30 at night or whatever time it is. Uh, so a group of us uh, at FCR, we wrote a paper on how the science of reading informs 21st century education. And I think even with this, what we, the, the, the four calls that we made where we need more basic research science, we need more innovation with interventions, we need better translational science where we have more individuals at the table that are talking about what do the data show, what do the data mean, and what do we do in light of the data. And we need stronger implementation science. We need to think about how do we localize screeners in varied contexts? How do we use some different kinds of language when engaging with families and caregivers? How do we move away maybe in some ways from yet red, yellow, green in our reports to something that isn't so um, embr is bracing. And so when you, as a parent, when you get a report and it shows like yellow or red, it's kind of a, it's stigmatizing at times. It's just, okay, what does this mean? There's not a lot of information. So I think uh, these four areas apply to what we're talking about tonight. When we're thinking about a risk and resilience framework, when we're thinking about trauma and growth mindset, we need more basic research science. This is, this is early stuff. There's a lot of opportunity for us to think about larger scale longitudinal research to understand what is the role of ACE in kids reading and language development. We need more intervention innovation. So Jeannie Wanzik and Stephanie Alatebu have been thinking about integrating growth mindset in reading interventions. What about trauma-informed care along with reading? Uh, when we think about translational science, if we're going to talk with social workers who are going to homes to do biopsychosocial intakes, how do we talk about screening? How do we talk about dyslexia in ways that's accessible? useful where parents have agency and they feel like they can participate in the reading development process of their child. And then I think we also have to acknowledge part of the elf in the room that we've talked a lot about today. What's the role of AI in all of this? Um, there, there's a lot of advocates for thinking about, well, we have lots of data, let's just throw AI at it and that's gonna help us solve our problems. And that's not the answer. Uh, AI is a tool and like any tool, uh, it, can, it can help, but it can also harm. And we need to be good stewards of technology. We need to be a, have a better understanding of how AI can help us make sense of data, not in a theoretically agnostic way, but in a way that helps enable teachers to be able to instruct in the classrooms and for parents to be able to act on that in the homes. And really, <laughs> sort of the takeaway from this is that we, need, we really need all of us. Um, pediatricians, uh, social workers, SLPs, everyone has a role that they can play in terms of early identification and thinking about supports for the child in the home, in the community, in the classroom. Everyone has sort of a unique role and a stakeholder role in kids' early development. I think taking advantage of the opportunity where pediatricians can administer the ACE in an office environment. Uh, SLPs can provide language assessments during a session. Social workers can provide or could provide uh, uh, reading screenings in the home. A lot of times we say to families, come to us, come for parent-teacher conferences. Sometimes families can't make it. Sometimes they can be threatened by it. Sometimes they can be scared of it. Sometimes they just can't get to meetings. Social workers represent an equitable solution to being able to go to the family and be able to say, here's what the child's reading scores mean. How can we partner together with the schools, with the teachers to be able to think about actionable information that parents can get involved in? So with that, I will open it up to questions, not open it up to questions. Okay.
So thank you so much, Jacob. I so appreciate everything you brought tonight um, and, and the depth here. I want to thank everybody at home. We're actually going to end the, um, uh, the, the live broadcast of this, and we're going to go to a little Q&A in the room here. So to everybody at home, thank you so much for joining. We so appreciate you in that, and uh, look forward to seeing you again in our next lecture. Thank you so much.